We are going live now. <coughs> ah, it popped up for a second, then it vanished. All right. Welcome. I, live now. I, I, I don't have the video. Um, I don't think it's quite on there yet. Well, it popped up for a second, then it vanished. We are now live on Facebook. So hello, everyone. We are here for our very first planetarium live, our planetarium at home. So this is our virtual planetarium event. We're going to let some folks filter on right now. Uh, so we'll get started here in just a couple minutes. Um, you can go ahead and say hi um, to us in the comments. Let us know that you're here. Um, and also let us know of any constellations that you know or you've heard of before. We're going to use that in the uh, first part of uh, what we're going to be talking about. So start putting those in the comments. All right, so and we're going to just get a couple things set up here. So just bear with us for a minute or so. Uh, but we will um, get started here in just a minute. I am seeing lots of folks come on. We've got someone named Orion. Oh, someone said Orion. I thought they said their name was Orion. <laughs> My cat's name is Orion. Um, all right, so we've got um, Zachary and Jonathan. Hello, good evening. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, I know we've got quite a few people um, from Michigan, but I think we've got some folks outside of Michigan as well. So let us know where you're tuning in from. So uh, we can let you know if the sky will be terribly different from uh, where we're talking about. So, Ophiuchus, that's not one we hear very often, I gotta say. All right, what else? Hello, the Crab Nebula. All right. Michigan as well. So let us know where you're Woo! tuning in from. Hold on. So, I'm hearing um, myself. Know if the sky will be terribly Because there is a 20 second delay and it popped on. So um, let me just turn that off right there. All right. Oh, we've got Maya who's a, from Girl Scout Troop 31627. Welcome. Um, we've got someone from Portland, Michigan, Fia, Kai, Dax, and Mac, welcome. We've got a lot of people tuning in today. We're so excited. Um, we've got Christian from the St. Anne Cub Pack, 1478, wonderful. Jennifer and Theo, Rowena and Marshall from Ohio, Grand Rapids, Lakeview, Sheboygan, Fowlerville, Clarkston. We've got people from all around Michigan, Mason, our neighbors right down the, the road from us in East Lansing. Oh, someone, an MSU grad from Napa, California. Welcome. So it's a bit in the afternoon for you. So thanks for joining us. Oh, Olivia from Grand Blanc. Grand Blanc. I'm not from Michigan originally. So if I mispronounce something, tell me. I kept calling Charlotte Charlotte for a long time. Oh, we've got um, Aria from Troop 77105. Got a lot of scouts here today. That's fantastic. All right. Troop 31627 in Wisconsin. All right. Plymouth, Michigan. We've got a whole lot of people joining us. Oh, I just saw someone from Lutherville, Maryland. Ooh, MSU alumni from Ferndale. And they love Abrams Planetarium. Well, we love you. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, by the way, I'm Dr. Shannon. I'm the director of the Abrams Planetarium. Today with us, we have John French, who is our production coordinator. He's going to be talking about some telescopes. So if anyone is interested in getting in, into advanced stargazing, he'll be talking all about telescopes and what to look for. Um, we'll have some other resources for you as well. That's gonna be the second half. The first half is going to be um, a star talk by uh, our wonderful student staff member, Rebecca Hatt. So she's on here as well. So Rebecca, you wanna say hi? I think you gotta unmute yourself. Hello everybody, welcome. I'm so excited, I can't wait. And John, you wanna say hi? 
Yeah, hi there. Glad to be here. Glad to be able to talk to everybody about all this stuff. It's going to be a lot of fun. All right. And then we also have Shane here. He's our education coordinator at, coordinator at the planetarium. He's going to be helping us with the comments today and any questions you might have. Um, there is a 20 second delay. So if you ask a question, we might not get to it right away. Um, just so that you know. Um, and also uh, uh, what we um, will be doing is we might not be able to get to all the questions. We have over almost 800 people on already. So if you have any questions, we might not get to all of them right away. But um, if you, you do have any, we'll try to get to them in the comments or the video. We'll try to get to as many as we can. But I think with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We are at about 7.04 here. So many people are on. So uh, Rebecca, you take it away. All right, thank you, Shannon. Uh, welcome again, everybody. So I'm gonna start um, sharing my screen here. And we're going to take a look at the night sky for tonight. Minimize that. All right. So well, welcome once again, everybody. Um, I'm going to be taking the lead from our uh, sky calendar here. Um, so that's how we're going to get started. If you have one of these at home, we make these. Um, so if you have a subscription, you'll know the answers to some of my questions coming up. If not, um, it'll be a fun guessing game. We'll get into that. Um, otherwise, subscribe to our sky calendar. It's $12 a month, and it's a great way to help support um, our planetarium. I have today highlighted, and I will go over this in just a minute here. All right, so I had or Shannon had you guys say some uh, constellations that you may know so we're going to get to a few of those but as you can see uh, Rebecca yes you said $12 a month $12 a year oh <laughs> excuse me thank you $12 a year a year that was a good catch thank you Shane $12 a year okay so and if you have more questions about the sky calendar, we have all kinds of answers for you. Just let us know and we'll get to those for you. Okay, so back to tonight. This is set for 40 minutes. Let's see what we have on our calendar. Yep, 40 minutes after sunset. So as you can see, the sun is still shining a little bit. So it's not quite dark. And this is again, um, Eastern Standard Time. This is from where we are here in uh, Lansing, Michigan. So you can see two very bright, dots here, these two bright dots. Um, now these two bright dots are planets. And so we're going to start with a planetary guessing game. I'm gonna give you some hints and you are going to type in what answers you think it might be. So these two planets here are can be found in our Northwestern sky. And I did it, I wanted to point out before the sun goes all the way down, because one of these planets, we're gonna start with this one here. This is the brightest object in our night sky after the moon, depending on if we have the moon up. Um, tonight, we have no moon. So this will be the brightest object in our night sky. And so that is the first hint for our first planet. The brightest object in our night sky after the moon. All right, another hint for this planet. It is the hottest planet in our solar system. The hottest planet in our solar system. We're getting some guesses of Venus and Mars. Venus and Mars, all right. Good guesses, good guesses. All right, so let's get to the answer. Someone did say Venus. So this is the planet Venus here, and it is the hottest planet in our solar system. Now there is a common misconception that Mercury is the hottest planet in our solar system. And that would be a very logical answer because Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. What makes Venus uh, so special is because of its thick atmosphere. So Venus has a thick uh, carbon dioxide atmosphere, which is a very strong greenhouse gas, which traps all the heat. So all of the sunlight that it absorbs, it goes right into the planet and gets trapped in there, heating it up. It's uh, over 800 degrees Fahrenheit, very, very hot planet. Um, so it's the hottest planet in our solar system. 
and it goes through phases. It's our brightest object in the night sky. Now, uh, tonight, it's actually at a, a thin crescent where it's, it's brightest. So because it has so many clouds, it has a very high reflectivity, which is called albedo, A-L-B-E-D-O. So its reflectivity is very high, um, and it's at its highest when it's a crescent, which it is tonight. So I will zoom in on that, but before I do that, I want to get to our next planet. So our other planet here, this, this guy down here, this is the, let's see, let's, what hit do I want to do? Let, this is the most cratered planet in our solar system. The most cratered planet in our solar system. Now keep in mind, um, I do want to mention that as these are really low to the horizon here, if you have some tall trees or tall buildings, they may be uh, out of your view. So you might have to move around um, to see these. All right, this is the smallest planet in our solar system. And our last hint, this is the closest planet to the sun, Mercury. So yes, we were just talking about Mercury. Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, but it has virtually no atmosphere, no way to trap in the heat the way that Venus does. So the side of Mercury that's facing the sun is super hot. Let's see, I have 279 degrees Fahrenheit, um, or excuse me, I'm sorry, 800 degrees Fahrenheit for its high, when it's facing the sun, but the other side of Mercury, the side that's facing away from the sun is cold. It is negative 279 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so very hot, very cold because it has no way to regulate that temperature by trapping in all of that heat. So cool thing about Mercury and Venus. So I got this uh, from our sky calendar here and I'm going to try and make it so you guys can see. I know it's really hard um, and I've got today highlighted and you can see this bright dot here and we've got this little dot here. This is Mercury and Venus and this is today and over today through Saturday they will get closer and closer and they'll reach conjunction and then they will pass each other with the moon. So I showed you that on our sky calendar. I can also show you that here. So I'm going to fast forward us so that we are, let's get my day jumper here. Move this out of the way so we can see. And we're just gonna move. So we've got tonight and then we've got tomorrow night. You can see they're getting closer. And the next night, now they've passed each other. And then on Saturday, we've got the moon. So the moon, Mercury, and Venus, Saturday. Um, let's see what time we have here. One hour after sunset, approximately um, 9.40 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, now I'm gonna bring us back to today. And I wanna zoom in and show you uh, the phase of the phases of Venus here, the phase that it's in. So we're just gonna go a little closer here. And if you get your telescopes out and later we'll have a video on telescopes, you could check out Venus and check out its phases. As you can see, we get closer. It's in a very nice thin crescent, super bright for us to see. All right. So now we're just gonna zoom back out. And while we do this and get ready for tonight, Shannon, do we have any questions so far? We do have a couple questions. Does Mercury rotate? And where is the moon? Mercury does rotate, I believe, Dr. Shannon. Yes, it, it does rotate. So it rotates uh, about, um, takes a over 100 over 100 days to rotate but it only takes about 88 days to go around the sun and so um it actually so it takes um 
it's the whole day is actually longer than its year, which is interesting. It rotates very, very slowly, but from day to night on Mercury is about 59 Earth days. So it does rotate, but it's super slow. And then the other question was, where is the moon? So luckily tonight we have no moon. Um, sometimes it's really cool to see the moon with your telescope. I really enjoy looking at the moon with my telescope. But on nights where we don't have a moon, it actually makes it easier to see some of our other constellations and stars because there's no ex extra light to dim out those stars. So no moon tonight. We'll see the moon uh, later on. I think I believe it comes up in the morning. And then the uh, another question is, is there a sharp contrast between the hot and cold sides of Venus or is there a gradient between the extreme temperatures? So Venus is approximately the same throughout because it has such a thick atmosphere. So Venus is just always super hot. Um, however, Mercury is the one where it doesn't have a way to trap the heat. So all of the heat that it gets is only when it's facing the sun. So Mercury has a really big difference in heat and cold based on what is facing the sun and what is away from the sun. Whereas Venus has a way to more regulate and has like a weather system where it can keep it, uh, keep the atmosphere, keep the heat trapped in. Did you want to add anything, Dr. Shannon? No, I think that that was good. Um... And then why does Venus um, look just like a bright star instead of a crescent in our sky? That I believe would be because of its reflectivity because it's just so bright. Um, John would be great to answer this question. You're muted, John. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was trying to answer some other questions on Facebook. Would you repeat the question for me, please? Shannon? Oh, am I there? Hello. <laughs> what was the question? Okay. I think, yeah, we're, we're getting so many questions. We're kind of getting overwhelmed in the comments there, but keep them coming. Keep them coming. The question is, why does Venus not look like a crescent in the sky? Why does it just look like a bright star? Well, it's just so far away that our eye can't really resolve the size. It's, 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 it's still pretty tiny uh, uh, in angular um, measurement. And so you know, we really can't see that with our eye, but with just a little bit of magnification, even a good pair of binoculars is enough this time of its year to be able to see it. So uh, it's just below the resolution that our eye can see as a crescent. But and, and then if you can look at it when the sky is still a little bit uh, light, you know, when there's still some, you know, some blue sky in there, you can see that crescent a little bit better. If you uh, wait till the sky is really dark, the contrast is so much between the black sky and the bright planet that it's really a little bit harder to see. And so, um, you know, try to check it out, <laughs> try, try to check it out then when, um, you know, when the sky is a little bit bright. <laughs> All right, hopefully that answers that question. Thanks, John. All right, yeah, I think let's, let's move on. We've got a lot of questions. You're gonna try to keep up with them in the chat. All right, so I've moved us facing north and I'm going to make us fast forward through time because we can do that. And we're gonna go to about two hours after sunset. So 1138, we're gonna try and do that. Um, and as we do, check out some of these constellations, see if you can point out if you recognize any. Um, here we go, let's see. So we're going to go another hour here. All right. So here we are facing north. And I try to keep our horizon nice and low here. And we're going to try to find the Big Dipper. So if you're familiar with the Big Dipper, try to find it on here. It is a great big uh, picture in the sky of a spoon or like a cooking pot made up of seven stars, four in the pot part and three in the handle. Our Big Dipper, it's used in many cultures all over the world. Um, and it's very important for one particular reason and we'll get to that in just a second here. All right. 
Here is our Big Dipper. We've got four stars here to make up the spoon or the pot part and the handle right here. So let's, there we go. Now our Big Dipper is a part of the constellation Ursa Major. So when you add all of these extra stars, we've got the full constellation. Uh, but for right now, we'll just be talking about the Big Dipper. So it's very important. Um, it was actually referred to as the drinking gourd in the South. And this, the slaves that were trying to get to freedom actually used the Big Dipper to help find North. So we're gonna find the North Star using our Big Dipper here. We've got these two stars. We call these our pointer stars because they're going to point us right to our North Star. So I want you guys to do that yourselves. I want you to try to guess which star it could be pointing to. Our North Star also has a name. Any guesses? I want you guys to go ahead and try to guess the name of the North Star. If you know it, type it in. Um, if you have a guess, type it in and we'll uh, see what some of those answers are. So we can take these two stars and we can just point to our North Star right here. And as you'll notice, our North Star is directly above our North Cardinal here. Now that's because our North Pole actually points right at this star. If we were standing on the North Pole, our North Star would be directly above our head. And as we go through the season, our North Star doesn't move because it is the because the North Pole points right at it. So our Big Dipper goes around the North Star as we go through the seasons. And as we're going into summer, the Big Dipper gets nice and high in the sky. So you can just look right up and find it. And as we get into the fall, it falls back down, but we can still point to our North Star. In the winter, it's very low in the sky. And then in the spring, it rises back up again, always going in a circle around our North Star. And this is a circumpolar constellation. It circles our polar star. Uh, Dr. Shannon, do we have any guesses about our North Star? Uh, I'll, I'll chime in. Yeah, we do have quite a few people that have guessed the name of it, and a lot most people have it uh, correct. It begins with a P. Want to go ahead and tell them what it is? It is. It's Polaris. And that's why we call these our pointer stars, too, so we can point to Polaris. And Polaris means pole star. It is our North Pole star. Polaris. Now, Polaris is a part of our Little Dipper. But the Little Dipper is pretty hard to see here in the city. These inner lights are very faint. In, inner stars, excuse me. These inner stars are very faint. But you might be able to point out these two here. And definitely Polaris. Now, as I mentioned before, this is Ursa Major. Let's get some art. Ursa Major here and the Little Bear Ursa Minor. And down here we have Cassiopeia, which is a W in the spring and summertime. And then as it goes around and in the winter, it's nice and high, it's a letter M. And we can use Cassiopeia, let me take this art off here, to point to our North Star as well. But because it is so low in the sky, you may not be able to see it. All right. So that is our Big Dipper. One more thing I do want to point out about our Big Dipper, and I'm going to zoom in again. I'm going to take our lines down. OK. There's a double star here in our Big Dipper. Miser and Alcor right here. You can kind of see the two dots, the two stars here. John, what kind of telescope or binocular would we might would we need to see Miser and Alcor? Well, you wouldn't need a whole lot of magnification. Even uh, with really good eyes, you can see the two stars uh, as separate. And I was I don't it's kind of an old wives' tale says that. Uh, back in the ancient Roman army, if you could see those two stars, your eyes were good enough to get into the army. And uh, if you couldn't see them, then they considered that you had bad eyesight. So, um, Well, better technology today is a good thing then. 
Right. Nowadays, uh, just, yeah, you can see them with your eyes, but a pair of binoculars. And then if you zoom in with a telescope with a little bit more magnification, you'll notice that each of those stars, especially Mizar itself, is a double star. And so there's really four stars there where you just see two stars with just your eyes. Awesome. Thank you, John. All right. We are going to move over just a little bit here to our northeast direction. As you can see, the star Vega here. This is the brightest in this constellation, and we'll get to that constellation in just a second. But before we get to this constellation, I want you guys to find a great big triangle. Look for a great big triangle using this star here. This is the summer triangle where it has three stars, each with its own constellation. Great big triangle using our star Vega here. Let's see if we can get a little closer. All right. So here's our first one. And right over here, oops, excuse me. Oops. Technology. There we go. There we go. So we've got Denup here and Altair here. So these three make up our summer triangle. Uh, this is an asterism, which is just another name for a shape in the sky. Um, anyone can come up with these at any time. So uh, sometimes it's a smaller part of a larger constellation, like the Big Dipper um, is a smaller part of Ursa Major, or Orion's Belt is an asterism of the constellation Orion. So this is actually each star is a part of another constellation. So first we have Vega here, and I want you to use your imaginations and try, let's see, let's do it this way. Let's, oh, okay. So since I clicked on Deneb, it's, we're gonna do Deneb first. So what does this picture make? What kind of picture can we make with Deneb here? And go ahead and type those in there in the comments. And as we do have a delay, so I'm going to move on and then we'll go, we'll go back to it. Vega, I'm going to click on it. Let's see, there we go. And Altair, that constellation there. So any interesting shapes that we can make out of either of these stars? We are getting lobster. Ooh. Bow and arrow. Yeah. Swan, bird, bow and arrow, a lot of bows and arrows and lobsters. All right. So I heard a swan and I heard birds. All correct. We have Deneb here. Let's get our art. In Cygnus the Swan. So the constellation here is Cygnus, the swan, and Deneb is just the brightest star in this constellation. And I do want to point out if you can, let's get rid of this art here real quick. See this fuzzy patch of light, this, this kind of line here, that's actually the Milky Way. So if you get a nice dark sky and you're able to find our summer triangle, you can find Deneb here flying right in the Milky Way. And then we have Altair, the eagle, another bird. So you're right there too. And we have Vega, the brightest in the constellation of Lyra. Lyra, the harp. All right. So we're gonna move out just a little bit here. And we're gonna move up. So get our horizon. So our horizon still, you can see a little bit, it's down here. But up here, we're going to go all the way up to our Big Dipper because we're going to do some star hopping. So, got to move some stuff over here. So here's our Big Dipper, the handle of our Big Dipper. And it kind of looks like a curve, right? Or an arc. So we're going to arc to the star Arcturus. We can arc 
to Arcturus. Now Arcturus is a very, very bright star. So it'll be nice and easy to see, especially in the city. Now, um, one of the downsides to all of the extra lights in the city is it dims out a lot of the stars or makes a lot of the stars disappear. But those stars that are in our favorite constellations are the brightest ones to see, make it easier to see these uh, bright stars in these constellations. So notice the difference between how easy it is to see the Big Dipper in your backyard maybe, or in the city, and then maybe uh, far away from the city, how easy or hard it is to find the Big Dipper. So, okay, so we're going to arc to Arcturus. And that is in the constellation Bootes. I like this one because it's fun to say, Bootes. And right next to Arcturus here, before we jump to our next one, We've got this half circle here, the Northern Crown or Corona Borealis. So just from our Big Dipper, we can find, we can arc to Arcturus and find Bootes and the Northern Crown. All right, we're gonna star hop again. I'm gonna take our art off here. Move us down a little bit. And we're gonna go from Arcturus and we're gonna spike to Spica. Now Spica is the name of the next star we're gonna go to. And I want you guys to guess where we're gonna spike to. We're gonna spike to Spica. Which star could it be? Get a better view here. And spike to Spica. All right, let's get some guesses. What constellation could this one be? To me, it kind of looks like a kite. But what do you guys think? What might this be to you? We've Maybe got What's that one? We've got someone saying that it looks like a plane. Ooh, someone yeah. It looks like the coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, not wrong. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. a crab, cancer, um, bootes, a person, Taurus, a horse, a dog or a cat. Great guesses. Great guesses. A chair. Uh, what Just was that one? What's the last one? A chair. A chair. <laughs> yes, absolutely, a chair. All right, this is Virgo. So we can, I'm just gonna back up a little bit here. We can take our Big Dipper and we can arc to Arcturus, the nice bright star here, and we can spike to Spica in Virgo. Now Arcturus kind of looks like an ice cream cone. So that's a good, easy shape to find. And it's nice and bright as well. All right. We're going to move over a little bit here. Now, right now, just between our south and southwest, we've got this square-ish shape. Corvus the Crow. I love finding this one. And again, it is lower in the sky, so maybe harder to find. Corvus the Crow. All right, we have just a few more here. As we go through our sky. So just to take away some distractions, I'm going to take away our artwork. And the next one I want you guys to look for, the next shape is a backwards question mark or a hook kind of shape. It's gonna be below our Big Dipper or Ursa Major, our Big Bear. Here we go, we've got our backwards question mark. Now this is a nice bright piece to find here of this constellation, sticks out very easy to find. And the star Regulus is right here, and it is the brightest in this constellation. Now, do you guys want to take some guesses what constellation this could be? 
while we wait for guesses, there is a question of where is the Andromeda galaxy? Oh, that's a great question. I don't believe Andromeda is up anymore, but Andromeda galaxy is great. Uh, winter find because it is located in the Andromeda constellation. Um, now our constellations are more than just our pictures or our lines that we see here. They're actually puzzle pieces. And I wonder, nope, we don't have that. So our uh, sky is broken up into puzzle pieces and the constellation is all of the space that is within that puzzle piece. So the Andromeda constellation contains the Andromeda galaxy. A lot of times that's the way they'll, they'll name the galaxies um, is where, or other objects is where they find it. So in the winter, we can find the Andromeda constellation and you'll look for the Andromeda galaxy. It'll look like a small fuzzy uh, bit of light. All right, we've got some guesses. We've got a hook, Maui's hook, a mouse, a rat, a swan, a duck, a squirrel, a clothes hanger, um more mouse more swan there was there's oh a vacuum cleaner Ooh. and leo the lion all right i really like the vacuum cleaner i don't think i've ever heard that one before or the hanger i've never heard that one before either i agree i think it definitely looks like a mouse you know here's this cute little nose and its tail but it is leo the lion good job yeah, so Leo the lion is a great one to find in the spring. It's actually setting as it goes into our western sky below the horizon. Leo is setting for the spring as we get into summer. Um, and now someone mentioned uh, the sickle um, Oops, for Moana. Um, we'll get a look at that one in just a little bit. So right below our big bear or our big dipper here, we can find the backwards question mark of Leo. All right, so now we're going to turn the sky just a little bit. And we're gonna go forward in time. Let me look at my notes, see how far forward in time we have to go. I'm gonna go back to the Southeast and I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit. Okay. 240-ish, okay. There we go, went a little fast, that's okay. That's okay, we can stop here. So as a note, around 2.40 is the time you can start to see these two bright dots. Anyone wanna take a guess as to actually three bright dots that we have here? We'll get into those two um, and I'll go into each of these, but I do wanna mention this one here doesn't come up until about 3.30, I did go far a little bit, but that's okay. So we're just gonna start over here in the south and southeast. So before we get to these two bright dots, we're gonna take a look for a couple constellations. Um, someone mentioned Maui's fishing hook. So yeah, let's take a look for Maui's fishing hook. It's gonna be really low in the sky, very, very low in the sky. Maui's fishing hook be almost directly south. Right here, it's covered up a little bit, but we've got the fishing hook. Now that's the brightest part of this constellation, which has this star here and Terry's. It's a nice bright star, nice and fun to find. And this brings us to Scorpius the great big scorpion. Now, right next to Scorpius and, uh, or Maui's fishing hook, if you see that here too, we have another constellation, but I'm gonna take our artwork off. Now I want you to look for a teapot, a teapot shape. It's gonna be next to our scorpion or a fishing hook. And the teapot shape is the asterism part of the constellation, the brightest part. We can zoom in a little bit there. So here's our teapot. And then we have all of these other stars that we connect to make a full constellation. 
Does anyone see any other pictures other than a teapot? I would love to hear what you see before I give away what it is. And you uh, someone is asking Rebecca if there is a galaxy near there. And uh, I think you probably know the answer to that. A galaxy, yeah, this right here. Yeah, we've got the Milky Way right here. And again, we've got Altair, our swan, or excuse me, our eagle from our summer triangle, right in that galaxy line. Yeah, the Milky Way. It's gotta be really dark, a nice dark sky. And that's actually the um, center of our Milky Way galaxy as well. We're looking right into it. Okay, any guesses on what this constellation might be? Or what it looks like other than a teapot? Well, I have someone saying fox, someone says crabs, someone says snakes, someone says boat, someone says pipe cleaner, and <laughs> someone says tortoise, a robot hat. Oh, I like uh, that. Yeah, and a spoon. And uh, let's see what other one, another robot. So a lot of, lot of good ideas here, a lot of great imaginations. All right. It is Sagittarius, the half man, half horse. The brightest part here is, of course, the teapot. Now, I wanted to point these out so that we can uh, look for our planets, these two planets here. And we're going to continue on with our guessing game. Um, let's see. We do have a lot of guesses as to what those ones might be. Okay. We have guesses that they are planets and that they are Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Venus, and Mercury have all come up as potential planet names. Well, that's not wrong at all. We definitely already saw Venus and Mercury, so we, we know those ones are up. We'll go zoom in a little bit. And yeah, so we're going to go with this first planet here, this bigger one. Actually, there we go. We got all three of them. You're absolutely correct. Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. Now, I want you to know if you can, and it's kind of hard to see with these labels on, so let me take those down. Can you see how red Mars is here? Mars is so red compared to these two. Now, Mars has a rusty red surface, and of course, that is why. It's red, it is the future home to humans eventually, apparently, we'll see how that goes. We get some, some humans on Mars. Um, Mars does have ice at its polar caps on the top and on the bottom. And I believe, John, question for you, can we see Mars's polar caps with any form of telescope? And at what times do we need to look to see the polar ice caps? Well, as a matter of fact, I got a message from Bob Victor recently, who is a retired astronomer at the planetarium, who said he was uh, able to see the polar ice caps recently in a telescope. And uh, about every, about approximately every two years, Mars and Earth end up on the same side of the solar system. And so we're going to be a lot closer to Mars when that happens. They call that an opposition. And this year is an opposition year. Uh, that is still several months away, but when Mars is near opposition, that's the time that you can see the polar ice caps on Mars. Uh, other times it's too far away, but when we get close to that opposition, you can see it, you know, with an average type telescope, you know, an average backyard telescope, you can see those polar caps under really good clear sky conditions. Awesome. That's definitely on my list next time. We get close enough to Mars every two years, not bad. All right, so now we have these two other planets here, Jupiter and Saturn. Now, Jupiter is the biggest planet in our solar system. It is made up of mostly hydrogen and helium, just like our sun. In fact, it's called um, a failed star as well because it didn't get big enough, bright enough, hot enough uh, to become a star, so it became Jupiter instead. Um, what, I have a question for you. What is one feature about Jupiter that you know of? What is one main feature about Jupiter? And uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in just a second. Now, our next planet, Saturn, 
one of the coolest things about Saturn is it has so many moons that they're still being discovered. Um, so my question for you is how many moons have we discovered so far today? We can round to the nearest, you know, 10 uh, for your guesses. So Jupiter, what is one feature that everyone recognizes about Jupiter and Saturn? How many moons have we discovered so far today? Do we have any guesses coming in quite yet? We've got the red spot and the rings and the storm. Um, and we have a question of, are the moons of Jupiter visible? Um, and yep, great red spot. So those are the ones that are coming in. Okay, yeah, so we'll start with Jupiter. Um, are the moons visible? So yes, the moons. Um, through a telescope, I actually got to experience this myself. It's pretty cool. There's the Galilean moons, um, the three moons that Galileo discovered. Now, depending on where the moon's positioned um, around the planet at that time, you should be able to see them. Um, when well, I got to look Four at moons, Rebecca, four, four Galilean. Did I say three? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, four Galilean moons. You know why? Because I only saw three when I looked through my telescope. That's right. So mm -hmm. one of them was behind the planet. So I could only see three of the four Galilean moons. Um, so depending on the time um, and where the moons are, you should be able to see a, a few of them, one to four, uh, depending on their location. Yeah, and uh, Rebecca, I don't know if you want to try this or not, but I think on the Stellarium there, you can zoom in on Jupiter and see those four Galilean moons. If All you right, let's give it one. a shot. Oh, I can start to see them. Yeah. So now when I looked through my telescope, I could only see, oops, this guy's moving so fast. I could only see uh, a bright dot and then three other bright dots. So as we talk about telescopes later, John, I'm sure you can inform us on what kind of lens would be a uh, best to see the moons and to maybe see the stripe, uh, the stripes of Jupiter. I haven't gotten to see that yet, but I know that we can. Um, and then someone also mentioned the great red spot. Let's see if we can get a look at that. There it is, beautiful. The great red spot. So that is a storm, uh, a hurricane-like storm that's been going on um, for a very long time. Humans have been watching it for over 400 years. Um, so far, we know that it's shrinking, it's changing a little bit in its color, um, and it used to be big enough to fit uh, four planet Earths just inside our storm here, but it is shrinking um, and changing quite a bit. All right, do we have any guesses about Saturn's moons? Uh, we have gotten um, 24, 100, 250, 272, 7, 238. A lot of different numbers. Those are all great guesses. Oops. So as of today, there are approximately 60 plus known moons. Is that correct? 82 now. 79. 79. See? Nobody knows. There's so many moons. Yeah, 79 on Jupiter and 82 on Saturn. Okay. So yeah, every day they're being discovered. Some of the moons actually live in Saturn's rings. Um, Saturn's rings, which are its prominent feature, are made up of tiny dust, um, ice, and rock particles, and are so thin that you can only see, let's actually see if we can zoom in on Saturn and see what we might be able to see through a telescope, depending on Saturn's rings here. There we go. Saturn is an awesome view through the telescope, if you can see it. Let me see, there we go. If you can view Saturn through the telescope and uh, see these rings here. But again, they are low in the sky. So you'll ha you might have to go away from, from the horizon a little bit. Let's see, not too low. That shouldn't be too bad, we'll, we'll see it. I guess it depends on when you go out to, at what time you go out to see these two planets. Now, even though Saturn is known for its rings, all four gas giants do in fact ring, have rings. Uranus, 
Neptune, Jupiter, and Saturn all have rings. Does anyone want to add anything else? Or do we have any questions? No, I think we should probably wrap up though. So John can start talking about telescopes. Yeah, let us know how we can see Galilean moons and Saturn's rings. All right, I'll stop sharing my screen and we will move on with the telescopes. All right, well, I guess uh, I'll tell you a little bit about telescopes. Um, as promised, I have a little telescope here. Uh, it's just one example of the many different types of telescopes there are. And so let me share my screen because I have a little uh, PowerPoint presentation that will be real quick and uh, uh, it will help explain a little bit about telescopes. I saw a lot of cool questions in our comments here and I'll see if I can kind of answer some of those questions as I do that. So let me find the right button here to uh, share this screen. And then uh, I am also going to close uh, some of the stuff that's streaming to try to get this to be a little bit <laughs> faster here. Am I still there? I hope I'm still there. Uh, all right, well, uh, a little bit about telescopes. So we have, uh, uh, oops, let's see, where is it? There we go. So there's a uh, uh, Typical telescope. Um, a lot of times when people think about telescopes, they think of those long skinny tube type telescopes up on a big tripod. And uh, those are great telescopes, but uh, there's a lot of different kinds of telescopes that people use nowadays. There's the uh, refractor that's the long skinny type telescope that people are kind of traditionally used to thinking about, where you look in one end and then you see out the other end. But then there's also uh, the reflecting telescope and a reflector. Typically, you look into the side of the telescope rather than looking in through the bottom of it. And then there's one that is uh, really popular, uh, but it's not as well known. It's the catadioptric, which is a kind of a combination of a reflector and a refractor. So if we look inside of a telescope, uh, the refracting telescope has a lens on the front of it, and they call that the objective. The light comes in, passes through that lens, and then goes uh, into the eyepiece and into your eye. And that's the simplest type. And that's the type that Galileo uh, first used when he was uh, looking at stuff with a telescope. Uh, then uh, Sir Isaac Newton came along and invented the reflecting telescope that instead of using a uh, lens, it has a mirror and it's a curved mirror that's at the bottom of the telescope and the light will come in from outer space, bounce off of that mirror and then goes up to a little secondary mirror that sends it out the side of the telescope and into your eye. And they still call that mirror the objective. So the objective can be either a lens or a mirror. And then the catadioptric telescope has both a lens on the front of it and a mirror on the back of it. And so that um, makes the telescope, um, it has some advantages and some disadvantages. It's a little bit shorter. And so it might be a little bit more portable if you have a catadioptric telescope, but uh, they do tend to be a little bit more expensive to have a combination of the lens and the mirror. Um, I know when people are first buying a telescope or thinking about a telescope, they often think that they have to get a lot of magnification. But magnification is not really a, a big important part of a telescope. Uh, the thing that usually is more important of a telescope is the aperture, or which is how big around the telescope is. So the fatter the telescope, uh, the more light can get into the telescope. And a lot of times you just want to make things brighter rather than trying to make things, um, rather than make things bigger. And uh, we often warn people to stay away from some of those uh, junky telescopes that advertise a really high magnification. That, you know, sometimes you'll see them saying there's 600 or 800 power. Well, you don't need that. Uh, a, it's one of these uh, typical telescopes here. Uh, if you have it 
at about 50 power or 48 power, that's enough to see the moons of Jupiter that we were talking about or that Rebecca was talking about. You can see the crescent moon or the crescent Venus. Uh, you can see craters on the moon. You can see the rings of Saturn, all with about you know, 30, 40, 50 power is enough to see some of that stuff. Uh, but another thing that's really important is the mount. You want to make sure that you have a really good, sturdy uh, tripod or mount on the telescope so that it doesn't wobble and wiggle if the wind would blow or when you move the telescope, you want it to kind of stay where it is when you let go of it. The cheap ones tend to wobble back and forth. So uh, one type of telescope that's very popular nowadays is called a Dobsonian telescope and they're usually reflecting telescopes if it's a Dobsonian and they are really sturdy and stable and they don't shake or jiggle and they point where you want them and they're pretty um, simple to build so they're not real expensive so I really like the Dobsonian telescopes and a quick Google search earlier today I just wanted to get some images of uh, Dobsonians and I saw there's you know a whole lot of homemade telescopes if uh, home, making telescopes is a really fun hobby, and if you're interested, um, you can build your own telescope, and uh, most of the homemade telescopes usually are Dobsonian telescopes, and that's kind of a fun hobby to get into. Another thing that you can do, uh, if you're in the Lansing area, the Capital Area District Libraries uh, loan telescopes that we, our local libraries have a a library of things program and I think that most libraries around the country do that so check with your local library and you might even be able to check a telescope out from the library another thing I wanted to mention uh, was that sky calendar because once you have a telescope you want to know what to look for and when different planets are going to be up in the sky and we create a publication called the sky calendar that shows what's up in the sky and uh, um, it's been around for um, for a long time, for you know, 50 years, and uh, we just love the sky calendar. It's uh, really useful. Rebecca was showing earlier about how uh, Venus and Mercury are going to pass each other. So here's kind of a close-up view. Uh, if we look here, you can see Mercury. Um, th this morning that just happened was right below Venus, but tomorrow morning it'll be a little bit closer, and then the next day is when the conjunction happens, that's when they're the closest, and then Mercury will be above Venus on the 22nd, and by the 23rd, the young moon, a very thin crescent moon, will be right below Venus, and that's always very scenic when you can see that crescent moon. Notice though that's 35 minutes after sunset, so there's going to be a little bit of twilight uh, glow there, but uh, the sky calendar is a great uh, resource the May issue every year. We always put it on our website because Astronomy Day happens in May and we like to make that free for distribution. But uh, normally you do have to get a subscription and all the proceeds from that really help out the planetarium. So we'd really love it if we can get more people subscribed to the planetarium or to, to the sky calendar. So go to abramsplanetarium.org slash sky calendar. Um, so does anybody have any questions? If uh, uh, Shannon and Rebecca and Shane, I think, are watching the questions. Does anybody have any comments or questions? I'm going to click stop share and get back to our view with everybody else. And uh, any comments, questions about telescopes that I might be able to help you with? Uh, I might also mention, too, there's a video that uh, I put on our YouTube channel recently that shows how to use a telescope a little 13 minute video so do check that out but uh you know i have this little telescope here maybe i can while we're waiting to see if there's any questions i can point out some of the different parts of a telescope so uh we have there's that objective lens or the the objective is the front the aperture is how big around the telescope is uh this has a nice sturdy base it's kind of like a dobsonian i guess you'd really call that a fork mount or a half fork mount um, the eyepiece is where you look into the telescope. And uh, then we have the finder scope. This little scope on the side of it is the finder scope. And we can kind of look in there. You can see inside the finder scope, there's little crosshairs in there that you would use to aim the telescope. And there I'm just aiming at my ceiling. So any comments, questions?
There is a question about the sky calendar. Does the sky calendar apply across time zones? Well, yeah, when we design and, and write the sky calendar, um, all the calculations are set for latitude of 40 and longitude of 90. And we've designed it so that it works over most of the continental US. Uh, but it, really a lot of it um, would apply for anybody at a mid northern latitude all the way around the world. So um, where things get quite different is if you try if you travel farther north or travel farther south then things start to look a little bit different. But generally it's designed to uh, cover all the things that you would see over the mid northern continental US. Uh, we've had quite a few questions as well about the cost of a telescope and specifically um, about the one you're holding. Can you talk a little bit more about the one you're holding and how much that costs as well as how much a Dobsonian would cost? Yeah, well, um, I tell you, I, I bought this telescope. This is my very first telescope and I bought this uh, back when Halley's Comet was coming around in 1985. Um, I don't remember what I paid for it then, but I bet it would be a little bit more. But I think that I don't know, one one place that we've bought some telescopes at the planetarium, and I've bought some for myself, is at Orion Telescopes. Uh, they're a reputable company, and I think they have some ninety millimeter catadioptric scopes that sell for maybe in the seven hundred dollar range, maybe. But some of those Dobsonians, like uh, I have a six inch um, Dobsonian telescope that I think I paid about $300 for. And so those are you know, much better value really. And they're, they're very portable and uh, pretty nice. Um, there's also questions on what you recommend as the best telescope for amateurs and beginners. Well, um, you know, like a, you know, about, you know, and I, I guess one of the things that always kind of um, comes up is, is um, you know, what's the best? And that's really kind of going to vary from one person to another. Uh, if you're more interested in being able to move the telescope and take it up north if you're going camping or something, you know, you're going to want something a little bit smaller and more portable. Uh, if you want... Um, if you're just going to have it in your backyard, you know, you could probably go ahead and get something a little bit bigger uh, to start with. Uh, you usually want to get as much aperture as you can afford. Um, but another thing that is always a thing that I always like to try to talk people into is a good pair of binoculars. You know, there's an awful lot of things that you can see with binoculars, and you can get a good pair of binoculars for a... Uh, pretty low price. And so even if you have a good telescope, usually you want to have some binoculars with you anyway. And during the day, you can also do bird watching too. So um, binoculars are good for beginners because uh, there's a lot of stuff to see with binoculars. There are questions about um, some other things. Uh, oh, do telescopes have to be recalibrated or anything? They, they have a hand-me-down and they'd like to know um, what to do with that. Well, check out that video that I made that's on YouTube. I talk a little bit about uh, the telescopes. I mean, um, the one of the things that you have to do fairly often uh, is uh, adjusting the finder scope. Uh, they tend to get out of alignment a little bit, but it's very simple and easy to, to line the finder scope up because you have to line that up exactly with the main tube. Um, it's almost like, you know, if you play a stringed instrument, you have to tune it every time you pick it up. Kind of the same with a, uh, uh, the finder scope. If you want it to be accurate, you have to adjust some of these little set screws here. But uh, that's really about all you have to do. Uh, there are some small screws on the back of the telescope, more so on a Dobsonian, that um, collimate the mirror. And if it's gotten bumped really hard and knocked out of alignment, you might have to readjust that. But normally, you don't have to worry about that. So usually, they're, they're usually pretty good to go. Someone likes your clock, John. 
<laughs> yeah, my cuckoo. Check out your office sometime. <laughs> yeah, I do like clocks. I have uh, quite a few cuckoo clocks and other crazy clocks. When we do eventually reopen, John, by the way, is also the curator of the Moist Towelette Museum, which is in his office. So there's something fun and quirky you can come check out as well. Um, oh, someone asked their old eyepiece is um, their their telescope is missing their eyepiece and are they universal? Um, yeah, usually um, most now th this is one of the exceptions, but most telescope eyepieces are inch and a quarter. Uh, this one is a little bit less than an inch. This is kind of the old style size, but normally they're inch and a quarter and they are the same diameter. Now, one thing that you do want to consider is the uh, focal length of the eyepieces. That, that's not getting into focus there, but um, the an eyepiece is going to tell you what its focal length is. This has 18 millimeters. I don't think you can see that. It doesn't seem to be focusing in on there. But um, the bigger the focal length of the eyepiece, the lower the magnification. And typically, you want to start off with the lowest power eyepiece that you have, because uh, that'll give you a wider field of view and a brighter image. So uh, get an eyepiece. Uh, make sure it's the inch and a quarter size, assuming that's what your telescope takes. If it's a really old telescope, it might take a small one, but uh, get one that's about a 25 millimeter or 12 millimeter eyepiece or something, and you should be good to go. All right. Um, well, I think we are at about an hour. And I think that's as much Zoom as most people can handle anymore. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I see that there's more questions. So I think we'll try to go through and answer as many as we can that we did not get a chance to answer in text. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us. I hope you had fun. Let us know in the comments as well if you'd like us to, to do any more of these in the future. Um, and uh, any topics you might be interested in hearing about um, on any future uh, planetarium at home shows. And also this is completely free, um, but if you would like to consider donating to the planetarium, if you enjoyed this, I did put a link in the comments and you can also find a donate button on abramplanetarium.org. Anything helps right now. Um, but uh, we love reaching out to everyone. We miss you all at our lovely building. Um, this is our virtual planetarium behind me, but one day we will see you back there in our lovely dome. Um, but until then, everyone stay safe, stay healthy, and go outside and look up, especially when there's not clouds and rain. Um, see you guys later. Bye-bye.